We welcome all of you to God's house this morning. How true the psalmist's words are. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. <clears throat> this morning we'll be following the order of service of the gathering rite on the word of God. If uh, anyone does not have the ivory booklet where that uh, order of service is found, please raise your hand and our usher will bring you a booklet. We're on page 21 there. We'll begin there in a moment. Just a reminder that um, what a blessing to gather together at the foot of the cross where this morning we'll be focusing our attention on the fifth word of our Savior from the cross. So our theme for our service is Jesus gives the water of eternal life. And there I'd just like to summarize the words why it's a blessing to use this order of service. It says there underneath the name, gathering right of the word of God. God's people long to gather together for strength from God and for mutual encouragement. This alternate beginning for worship may be used on any occasion to remind all of us of the blessings we have in the holy word of our God. We begin. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. page 21 in the front of the, I should say in the back of the ivory booklet. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Oh, are not. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yet, so often, we have despised God's word and failed to gladly hear and learn it. For this and all our sins, we bow before God and humbly ask his forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity but I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
God gave his word so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus who lived a perfect life for you, died on the cross to pay for all your sins, and rose again to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. readings. We invite you to follow along, if you like, in the worship folders. Our first scripture reading is taken from Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning with verse 1. And here our God reveals how powerful his word is. What a thirsty water that quenches hurting souls. It's the power of the word strengthens those of us who believe, and it's powerful to bring to faith those who do not believe. What a beautiful picture we have here in Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out, of the, out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We invite the congregation to open their hymnals to the very front part, 
And that's where we find Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a beautiful confession of sins written by King David. It's a, it illustrates our faith that the, the word of God has brought us eternal life and we want that gift. We confess our sins as a evidence of our faith. We join in singing Psalm 51. Turn our attention back to our worship folders, and there we have printed for us the, the Psalter Psalm Prayer. We invite the congregation to join in saying it together. Lord, we confess our sins to you and plead for your mercy. We acknowledge that sin runs too deep in our nature for us ever to rid ourselves of it but we thank you that Jesus has done what we could not do, washing us clean of every stain. We plead that your spirit would give us the strength to live a new life through Jesus our Lord, amen. Then we turn to Paul's letter to the Romans, that spectacular chapter, chapter eight, beginning with verse 11. And here Paul explains some of the eternal blessings that are ours through the water of life that Jesus gives us, through the word of God. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. 
For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The verse of the day, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. So now we invite Zach Weiss to come forward and share with us the Passion History according to St. Matthew as it's recorded in Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 27. Soldiers mocked Jesus. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him, saying, Hail the king of the Jews. They spit on him and took the staff and hit him repeatedly on the head. The crucifixion. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out to the city, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon. They forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. They offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. After they had crucified him, they divided his clothing among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and were keeping watch over him there. Above his head, they posted a written charge. This is Jesus, King of of the Jews. At the same time, two criminals were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. People who passed by kept insulting him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, experts of the law, and elders kept mocking him. They said, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. God, Let God rescue him now, if he wants him, because he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him kept insulting him. Jesus dies. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, this fellow is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, and soaked it with vinegar. Then he put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Once more, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, and rocks were split. Tombs were opened, and many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised to to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were Guarding Jesus with him saw the earthquake and things that had happened. They were terrified and said, Truly this was the Son of God. Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee, who had served him, were there watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Jesus' burial. 
When it was evening, there was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered the body be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb that he had cut in the rock. He rolled a large stone over the tomb's entrance and left. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting opposite the tomb. The guard. And the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered in the presence of Pilate and said, Sir, remember what the deceiver said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. So give a command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise the disciples might steal his body and tell the people, He has risen from the dead. And that last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go, and, go make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and posting a guard. Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, whoever drinks the water that I give, it will well up in him and spring up in him as a well to eternal life. Jesus said that in John chapter 4, verse 14. So we focus together today, as mentioned, on Jesus' fifth word on the cross found in John chapter 19, beginning with verse 28. We invite the congregation to read along. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. This is the word of our great God. In Christ Jesus, our perfect lamb and our perfect savior, my dear friends. Have you ever been so thirsty that your tongue was glued to the roof of the mouth? <clears throat> I doubt it. We are so blessed. We have an abundance of water, especially 
in our great country, in our great state of Wisconsin. But <clears throat> gee, we're told, actually, that this is one of the most agonizing things of the crucified victim is the thirst. And just think of it, my friends. Jesus' suffering had begun at about midnight the previous night, there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said how his, he was overwhelmed with sorrow at the very point of death. And we can <laughs> safely assume from that point on, no one ever gave him a drink. And think of all of the suffering he's gone through. And now almost six hours have been completed on the cross. Let's gather there at the foot of the cross and ponder these words. Let's learn from them. Jesus says, I thirst. Note, first of all, Jesus' great need and also then Jesus' great gift. Our text reads, Later, knowing that all was now completed, the Lord Jesus knows all things. He knows the end is right around the corner in spite of tremendous agony from his thirst that he must have been struggling with for hours and hours already. In spite of that, in spite of all of the bloody mess in his body, all the pain and agony there, he must have had a sense of relief, a sense of comfort in his heart. The end is near. All was now accomplished. Maybe we have a small example of that in the case of a runner. He's poured himself out. He's running his fastest, and now he's coming around the home stretch. And with a second wind, he can have a burst of energy, cross the finish line, and perhaps win the race. And that, to the nth degree, maybe, was in Jesus' heart at this time. We know from a review last week, and also from the scripture reading from Matthew, Jesus had just completed the worst when he cried out in the dense darkness, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's taken the very hell itself because of his great love for each of you, for me, for the whole world, to pay the price for our sins. So that has been completed. There's some relief. Maybe there's even a sign of that end of his suffering Perhaps now, out of that dense darkness, the light is beginning to shine once more. And so that the scripture would be fulfilled. He knows all things, dear friends. He knows our words before they're out of our mouth. So he knows there's more scriptures to fulfill. What scripture? Psalm 69, verse 21. They gave me vinegar to drink. And why was this important? Psalm 22, David wrote both Psalms, 69 and 22. And there in Psalm 22, verse 15, we read, My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have brought me into the dust of death. Jesus has some important words to say. And he needs to have that tongue loose. It's going to be a shout. It's going to be a victory cry. Greater than any victory cry if the Packers win the game. Far greater and far more important, obviously. We might compare it to the shot heard around the world there at the Battle of Lexington and Concord outside of Boston when the Revolutionary War began and resulted in the formation of our great country, the United States of America. Far more important, obviously, is the victory cry. It is finished. The shout that Jesus wants to go around the world, dear friends, the shout you and I want to hang on to, should we ever doubt that our sins are forgiven? Should we ever doubt that Jesus did not complete his mission? So we'll focus more on those beautiful words uh, next Sunday. So as a result, Jesus said, I am thirsty. In the Greek, it's one word, four letters. I am thirsty. Isn't this amazing, my friends? All is hours of suffering, and according to the scriptures, not one complaint, not one groan. 
like a lamb led to the slaughter. Just one word for a smidgen of comfort. I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. So the soldiers had a smidgen of compassion. <clears throat> and my friends, we should remember wine vinegar is not something painful. It's actually the drink of the poor people of the land and the drink that was given to the Roman soldiers for their lunch as they carried out their duty. So they would have that readily available. So kind of them to share it with Jesus. And by the way, my friends, those artists that picture Jesus way up high on a cross, they have it wrong because uh, the plant, the hyssop plant, it has a sprig about 18 inches long. So that means Jesus was fairly close to the ground when the soldier lifted up the sponge to Jesus' lips so that he could free that tongue. And as, as Zach read, why, why this? That in Matthew 27, verse 34, it says they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink it. Dear friends, there's a big difference between wine mixed with gall and, and wine vinegar. Wine vinegar is a, least, a less expensive wine, as we already mentioned. But wine mingled with gall, a very bitter drink. And we assume it's, at least the commentaries tell us, this was something to deaden the pain, something to, again, a little bit of mercy to the victims of crucifixion to help deaden the pain. Jesus, isn't this amazing of Jesus' great love for us? He doesn't want the pain deadened. He wants to take the full brunt of God's wrath for sin because of his great love for each of you, for me, yes, for the whole world. In fact, we have a little example of this wine mingled with gall in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 6 in the days when there were no medications to deaden pain. There it says, give strong drink to one who is perishing and wine to the bitter in soul. So God has a solution for pain, even when we didn't have pain medication. And I think of with this issue of pain medication, how blessed I was. And maybe all of you had, a, had an experience like that too, a wrestling injury, a dislocated shoulder, and uh, it's the closest I ever want to come to hell. And when I finally got a shot for the pain, after two hours of gnashing teeth, <laughs> it felt like the Lord was taking me from hell to heaven. So praise the Lord for the medication we do have to help with our pain today. <clears throat> so dear friends, how great is the suffering Jesus went through. How great is his love for each of us. So how great is our love for him? Are we able to put these words into practice in our lives? Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's a reminder, isn't it? It's not always easy to be a child of God and live the fact that we are God's children. We are sheep of the good shepherd. Think of our own weaknesses. Have, have we a weakness or a stubborn streak? Is there something that we're going to make an excuse? That's just the way I am, so I'm going to keep on sinning? No. As children of God, we have the strength from our Lord to say no to ourselves. Maybe even call ourselves by name. Shar, stop thinking that way. That's sin. Or do we have a cross to carry? Maybe some kind of pain or suffering of some kind? Can we do it? Take it to the Lord in prayer and conclude, not my will, but thy will be done. Our God knows more than we. He knows what kind of tests we need. So we stay close to him and don't end up in eternal suffering in hell. He wants us in heaven. And he knows what we need so we can trust him. Are we willing to carry that cross without complaining like Jesus did? or maybe even a greater kind of pain. You have a heartache because someone, maybe someone you love, maybe someone in your own family, 
has disowned you because you stand on the scriptures and a former friend or family member has disowned you because they don't. They have no love for Jesus. They have no love for standing up for the truth. Are we able to carry that cross? Keep the person in prayer, of course, but realize not everybody has drunk of the water of life that Jesus has for us and come to faith in our Savior. So are we able to follow Jesus, follow his example of love like he does, have that love for us? Are we able to think like he does, believe what he says, and act accordingly? Not always, right? We all have to confess our sins as we, as we have done a number of times this morning in this Lenten season. So you and I, dear friends, we deserve a tongue glued to the roof of our mouth. We deserve to be in a, a desert to die, but even far more. We deserve to suffer like that rich man in the account of the rich man and poor Lazarus. Not even one drop of water for comfort in the flame of hell. That's why we are tremendously blessed. We have great comfort and great joy to gather at the foot of the cross and realize, as we sang so marvelously in the previous hymn, he did that for me. He did that for you. How awesome to listen to those words. How meaningful they are. That he was thirsty. He had this great need. And he, as true God, didn't do something about it. He was going to take that cup of suffering all the way to the bitter end. For you, for me, to assure us as his thirst was satisfied by the hand of the Roman soldier, his great need was met, physically speaking, so you and I could have a great gift. It blows us away, my friends, when we think of Jesus, not only his great suffering, but how great he is. After all, like it says in John chapter 1, verse 3, through him all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. He's the creator of all things. Think of it, that great power he has. And of course, creating this whole universe with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So that, think of all the water he made. All those vast oceans, so deep and so wide. He created that. And think of all the wonderful lakes we have in this great state of ours. So many places to go fishing if you want. Go swimming if you want. And, of course, at our fingertips, whether it be the nearby faucet or the bottle of water that we buy so we're, wherever we go we can have a drink of water. We have all of that. Jesus didn't have it on the cross, but he suffered until he could make that victory cry. And because of the water of life he gives us through faith in him, the Lord is my shepherd, we can confess, like David did in Psalm 23. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. This is a picture of the word of God, my friends. A reminder to do, to start if we haven't, haven't been doing it, make sure we have a quiet time. Make sure we have a time when we read our Bibles so God can talk to us one-on-one -on -one that way. Give us some more of that wonderful water to drink that wells up within us to eternal life. And refreshes our souls. Doesn't it remind us of that wonderful invitation, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your souls. No amount of sleep will give us rest for our souls. Only gathering at the foot of the cross gives us rest for our souls, the confidence, our sins, all of them, are forgiven. In, in place of a sinful record, a perfect record, because God looks at you and me who believe in him through, faith, through Jesus. He sees Jesus' perfect record, kept every commandment for us, and a clean slate, which had been stained, mightily stained, with every sin we've ever committed. That's gone. So we have this wonderful picture as the children of God traveled in the wilderness. They did not thirst when he led them through the desert, he made water flow for them from the rock. 
he split the rock and water gushed out. Can you imagine this? This is desert, wilderness. And all of a sudden, with God's greatness, a rock splits and water pours out. And the Apostle Paul explains more about that awesome phenomenon. And drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So a beautiful picture for God's Old Testament people, for you and me. Water to satisfy our bodies. Yeah, doctors will tell us that's the best thing for us to drink, water. But at the same time, it's Jesus who gives us the water of life that wells up within us to eternal life. As Jesus spoke to the, to the woman at the Samaritan well, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Have you ever crossed paths with a spring? It's pretty awesome. A water, a land so rich, it just bubbles up. You don't have to turn on the faucet. We have one where my wife and I take a walk. We thought, is that the, that, that should not be um, the sewer. Mm -mm, you'd smell it. It's water bubbling up. See, a spring. That's how rich our land is. We have springs of waters in some places. And dear friends, with this water of life that's blessed us so much, given us such great things, we want to continue to listen, continue to be thirsty for the water only Jesus can give. And Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, says, Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That's where we can drink to our soul's content. And we're encouraged in Isaiah 48, verse 18, to pay attention. Not like the children of Israel who heard the words from Isaiah and con continued on their sinful paths. No, if only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. Need peace because you're carrying crosses? Need peace because you're troubled from our own weaknesses like the Apostle Paul's, the good that I would, I do not, the evil that I would not, that I do. We have, all have weaknesses like the Apostle Paul. Need help? Continue to drink the water of life. Continue to stay in the word of God. That's what gives us the strength to have peace that comes from loving our Lord, paying attention to what he says, put it into practice. Jesus says, I thirst. It illustrates his great need that was satisfied so he could take care of our greatest need, give us the gift of eternal life. Let's live for him. Amen. And the peace of God, which is beyond our dream, shall guard and keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We invite you to open up the hymnals now to page 210. That's where we have the wonderful confession of faith in this words we sing in English. We praise you, O God. In Latin, it's called the Te Deum. So page 210, we invite the congregation to arise.
We rise and pray. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to free us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the, for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. We pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. We pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. We pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers, and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. And here are special requests, Lord. We pray for rain. First of all, we thank you sincerely for all the prayers that have been answered, for she was not expected to live and breathe on her own, but you performed a miracle to keep her alive in, in this tremendous trial she is in, but of course she still has a long ways to go. So grant her the patience and strength she needs to keep on working those muscles that had suddenly and strangely become so stiff and unmoving. We thank you, Lord, for being with her and continue. We pray that you would come quickly, if it be your will, and restore her health and her strength soon. We pray also for our sister in Christ who is in the former Willowbrook home there in Lake Mills. We pray, Lord, that in thanks first that you have helped her through a challenging time, but she's still in pain and still struggles with weakness. So be her comfort and strength as well, we pray. And Lord, we hear that there was a terrible cyclone called Fred, Freddy there affecting our fellow believers and all kinds of people in Malawi and, um, and two neighboring countries where entire villages were just washed away. Hundreds of people again lost their lives and homes destroyed along with crops that were ready to be harvested. So great challenges face our, our people and all the people there. So graciously come to their rescue, sustain them and provide for them. We pray in Jesus' name, and in his name we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we continue with hymn 425. Go to Dark Gethsemane, 425.
pray. <laughs> In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. We thank thee, our Heavenly Father, that you have graciously kept us this night, and we pray that you would keep us this day also from sin and every evil, that all my do our doings in life may praise you. We ask that your holy angels would be with us, that the wicked foe would have no power over us. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. may be seated as we conclude with In the Cross of Christ, I Glory. <laughs>